Hello, everybody. Uh, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, who is Maria Amar. She is the Associate Dean of ESL at Salt Lake Community College. She's the past president for Intermountain TESOL, a TESOL affiliate that includes Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. And she is also past chair of the Higher Education Interest Section. Her interests include teacher education, supporting students with disabilities, and higher education. And her topic for today is uh, professional development opportunities in your affiliate. And let me give you a little bit of a description of what she's going to be talking about. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many affiliates to make changes to their normally scheduled spring and fall conferences and events, including having to do such things as doing cancellations, going virtual, and restructuring offerings. Creativity and professional development became a great priority for affiliates because of the inability to offer in-person activities. Affiliate leaders had to adopt to, a new, to the new circumstances and look to their members on how they could continue with their mission to provide professional development. This session will highlight some type of professional development that may be practical to offer, beneficial for affiliate members and manageable for affiliate leaders. So with that, I will hand this over to Maria Mar. Hello, thank you, Bessie. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, James, um, also for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. So let me get there. Okay, so um, yes, so in that introduction, um, it, it pretty much really just gives a summary of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm also gonna be talking about the IT SOL experience, um, just to give you an idea of what we had to do in IT SOL um, um, because of the pandemic. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So first of all, um, definitely the COVID-19 pandemic um, definitely um, had an effect on all affiliates, not just um, ITSOL. And uh, if you were reading all of the discussion boards, community boards from all of the affiliates, you probably saw everybody was saying, oh my gosh, I, what are we going to do? We have our fall conference who was supposed to be in person and we, didn't, we, we don't know what to do. And um, we're going to probably have to go virtual. And um, so, yeah. And and uh, I can tell you that when I was looking at the community boards, I was seeing that a lot of affiliates were getting very creative, um, putting different types of offerings all over the place um, through TESOL, through their own affiliate. And um, it was really, really great to see. Um, I met one woman from, um, I believe from Eastern Europe, and she said she actually had gone to 40 webinars that had been offered through affiliates and through um, TESOL freely and, um, and she was enjoying all the offerings. So um, I was really impressed with that. Um, also, um, just to say that uh, I know for some affiliates, um, there have been struggles because of issues with definitely internet co connectivity and um, you know that uh, to make things fair for each of their members because each of their members definitely have different needs. So all of that um, is something that we have to consider. Okay, so um, here I, I, I'm just again introducing Intermountain TESOL, uh, my affiliate. Um, we call ourselves ITESOL. And um, we do include Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho in the United States. Um, we have about 150 members who are educators and administrators who work in K through 12 schools, higher education and community-based adult education programs, and also in um, private language schools. 
Um, our board consists of members who are educators and administrators from a variety of institutions who have diverse educational and work experience backgrounds. Um, we meet regularly. Um, uh, I think we meet about four times a year and um, we had always been meeting um, virtually um, because we're located in different areas and can't just meet in person. Um, and so, um, so doing the virtual board meetings was something that we were doing pre-pandemic and, and, um, and then we continue to do it during the pandemic and now. Um, annually, we do have a fall conference and this usually has a keynote speaker or speakers and more than 60 presentations. Um, and then also we, we do make sure that we have an in-person social networking gathering um, so that um, uh, participants can come and meet and, and uh, talk to others in the field. And um, we do also have a spring conference, which is a little bit smaller, um, but we do do different things like we'll have keynote speakers sometimes, we'll have um, members do teaching tips sometimes, we'll have discussion topics, um, and then sometimes we'll have presentations. Um, other things that we do is we have an online newsletter. Uh, we have a, um, a website for our affiliates. We do use social media like Twitter and Facebook. We have a job board. So when um, different members tell us about positions that come available um, at their institutions, we do put those on the job board for our members. Uh, we also have a, a email discussion group um, that um, anybody can post to from our members. And um, we also do make sure that we represent our group at, T at the TESOL convention. Um, and we do this with um, presentations. Um, we, we make sure that we are um, at the information booth to talk about ITSOL. And also we um, do social gatherings with other affiliates like Colorado TESOL. So, um, Last March, um, pretty much uh, Utah was uh, declared a place where we had to um, start doing not really lockdown, but it seemed like lockdown. Um, so um, everybody was pretty much told, okay, everybody has to start thinking about working from home. Um, you know, um, schools got closed down um, so that um, students had to go and learn online for K through 12. Um, my community college, Salt Lake Community College, went completely remote um, in March 2020, and so did other institutions in the state. Um, and so um, as far as social events, social events were pretty much, um, uh, organizers were pretty much told you cannot have your um, social events um, because only we are only allowing social events that have 10 um, people. And so for example, our spring conference is usually 50 or more attendees. Um, so we definitely had to make a decision at the very last minute on what to do for that. Um, what we ended up doing was we decided that um, we had to cancel it. Um, there was consideration to do it virtually, but um, we were like just about to do it in person. And um, so yeah, we, we just decided that we needed to cancel it. Um, and then um, March 2020 TESOL convention also, the in-person um, convention was canceled and moved to a virtual platform. And many of our members were going to present at the in-person convention. And then also we were going to do the usual things that we do represent ourselves there. And then um, the fall 2020 TESOL conference ended up having to be changed from in-person to virtual. Um, this is our conference where usually all of our members attend plus more members. Um, and so, um, and we um, pretty much realized that, um, uh, well, I could tell you that our first vice president um, was trying to get catering down and um, get it a location down, but nobody was um, giving any confirmation because nobody knew what was going to happen in the fall. So we ended up having to decide that it had to go from in person to virtual. So some of the things that we did um, to um, make sure that we were serving our members um, with professional development is one, um, 
we uh, sent out a survey to members to ask about what topics they would be interested in learning more about or having some kind of professional development for. Um, and then we, um, we got the topics back in the survey that we sent out. And one of the, um, uh, the, the most um, important topics that members were saying that they wanted to hear about was remote teaching um, and maybe tips for remote teaching or how people adapted for remote teaching or what they did for remote teaching. So um, we sent out a, a call to our members to ask for anybody who would like to do a presentation about remote teaching and their experience. And then we, we informed those individuals that what we were going to do is we were going to have them go ahead and record their presentations. Um, and then send us the recordings and then we would go ahead and post it on our YouTube channel to share for free with all of our members. Um, we got um, five uh, volunteers who gave us very different presentations and we did go ahead and post them on our YouTube channel and we shared it with our members and we let everybody know that, you know, this is something um, especially uh, to since we didn't get to do the spring conference, at least this was something that we could do. And, and we did this in June and offered it up to our members. Um, and then also we continued on with our newsletter, um, putting articles in there um, and also um, making sure that we were continuing to post on social media with information about members, um, about ITSOL, about TSOL. Um, we let our members know that TSOL had um, was going to offer the virtual con convention in the summer. And then um, for ITSOL, we let them know also that we were um, going to do a virtual conference in the fall. And we put out our call for proposals and also informed our members of um, how we were gonna um, do it virtually. So going on to the ITSOL fall 2020 virtual conference, um, the ITSOL Fall Conference was changed from in-person to a virtual platform. And through our ITSOL board members, um, we really worked hard together to plan, organize, and do this, make sure that this virtual conference was going to happen. Um, I can tell you none of us are IT specialists and probably many other affiliates will probably say the same thing as far as having to go virtual. Um, so it was a, um, a lot of training that was involved. And um, I mean, the good thing is that most of our IT South board members had been teaching remotely um, on Zoom or WebEx, you know, for the most part um, since March. And so, um, you know, with that little experience, um, that definitely did help. Um, we we did have we did make sure that we met with a Zoom representative so that we can understand how we could put together a virtual conference with them, and um, and then, uh, like I said before, we we have different degrees of technology experience, but this definitely helped our um, past president. Um, was like really great. She she put together um, definitely the presentations uh, to be posted on the YouTube channel um, for that free uh, professional development. And then um, she like pretty much like said, okay, this is what we're gonna need to do. We're gonna um, need to make sure that um, we get pre-recorded sessions and and then have the presenters come and do Q and A afterwards and. Um, but I, I would definitely say that for her, she said that she got a lot of her ideas from the TESOL 2020 virtual convention, seeing how it was done there, and, and also other virtual offerings um, that um, other affiliates were doing. Um, so definitely we were learning from others um, on how we were going to um, present our conference. The ITSOL Fall Virtual Conference Schedule Program looked very much like our regular conferences that were in person. Um, we had the same offerings, keynote speeches, workshops, teaching tips, and research-based sessions. Um, we had um, almost the same number of presentations as we usually do as in person. Um, so we, we had quite a, a few um, proposals.
Did we lose Maria there? Um, I think so. Let's see if she can come back in. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame there. We've, uh, um, hey, like Maria, you're back. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just went out for a minute. <laughs> oh, that's okay. It, uh, you know, what are you going to do, right? Uh, it's online. It happens all the time. <laughs> right. I'm going to go back to share my screen again. I'm sorry about that. No worries. No worries. I'm glad you're it, able to get back it fits, in. It fits in well with a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and how do you adapt, right? <laughs> okay, so let me just go back. Okay, so yes, we're back to the same page. Okay, so um, so yeah, so that was, it was really great, you know, that we were able to have both keynote speakers. Um, they were co-presenters. One was, I believe she was presenting from Norway and the other one was presenting right here from Utah and they were able to co-present together um, for both days. Um, and then, um, we made sure that we um, accommodated our vendors, um, such as publishers, and they were able to give presentations and have a like a Zoom room where they could talk about, you know, their products um, with participants. And then um, we also were able to lower our registration fee for our attendees because the cost of the conference was so much reduced. Um, you know, the big chunk that we pay is um, food. Um, so that really raises our costs. So since we didn't have any food um, to have to cover, that definitely lowered it for us. We did consider using um, our board members' private Zoom accounts from their institutions um, to, to use to um, to do the, the Zoom rooms, but then um, uh, we realized it would be really difficult because that person would have to be on all day um, to, and you know, most of our board members were doing other things. So we decided to go ahead and purchase licenses um, with Zoom um, so that we could have, we, I think we had like five Zoom rooms um, to do sessions um, all day Friday and all day Saturday. Um, because we always have our fall conference on Friday and Saturday. And then um, all of the sessions were recorded and then we uh, posted them on ITSAL, the ITSAL YouTube channel for conference participants to view after the conference. And an email was sent to them with a password so that they could log in and, and see those um, presentations afterwards. Okay, so. Um, our spring conference is actually happening today, right now. And um, uh, it's from 10.30 to 2.30. So probably right after this, I'm gonna step off and go to that. Um, our spring uh, conference is also virtual. Um, and we also had to switch from in-person to virtual, but because of our experience from the fall uh, virtual conference, um, we were all set and prepared to, to run this one. Um, we have two guest speakers um, in the morning sessions and then the afternoon we're doing um, like topic discussion sessions that are facilitated by um, uh, different board members. And then um, also our, if you look at our conference program, it also looks very similar to what we've done in the past. Um, and, you know, in, in past conferences, we've had guest speakers, we've had discussion groups, we've had teaching tips. So um, yeah, so the offerings are pretty similar. And I can tell you registration is actually, um, usually we get about 50 plus members who come to our spring conference. And so far, the last time I saw, we had pre-registered 54 members um, and always we have walk-ins. So, so it's, it's a, a good um, number of people who registered. Um, we 
let everybody know that we were not charging for the conference, but if anybody wanted to donate, um, you know, to help with member cost, um, uh, we were asking for a donation of $5. We wanted to offer it free because again, the big chunk of our money for paying for this conference is usually food. And since we, there was not gonna be any food, um, we were saving on that. And this time what we decided to do with Zoom was try that, um, using every you know um, different people's uh, zoom accounts um, for the conferences and and uh, board members readily um, uh, volunteer to do that so um, so yeah so right now what what's happening is I believe we have um, we have four rooms four zoom rooms and in the morning we're just using two for the guests or just using one for the introduction and the two guest speakers. And then in the afternoon, we're using the four because of the breakout sessions that we're doing in the afternoon. Okay. Um, right now we are in the process of getting ready for our fall conference, which will be in October. And we've made the decision that we're going to do a hybrid conference. We're um, doing it in, um, I guess the location is kind of like South Central Utah. It's located at Snow College in Nephi, Utah. And, um, <clears throat> and their college has actually been in person since uh, this spring. Um, they've had in-person classes. Um, so, um, so they have been operating in person for the most part. Uh, everybody's been on campus working, not having to work from home, which is a little bit different than Northern Utah, where, like where I'm located. Um, my college, where most of um, our um, faculty and staff have been working remotely. Um, so um, it's, it's definitely different from area to area. So, um, so we decided to do a hybrid conference because we wanted to accommodate all participants. We knew that probably some people would not be comfortable with being in person. Um, in October still. Um, and then we knew that some people would be okay with being in person. Um, so, so we're going to offer that. And what we're planning to do is um, have these in-person presentations and record them um, uh, and show them on Zoom so that people can actually um, view them you know, what, live and then also see them later. Um, I've been to um, a conference uh, that was done that way pre-pandemic, and um, it was actually pretty effective. Uh, and I remember, like, um, definitely the chat par participants were very active uh, in in making sure that they were asking questions and making comments and having discussions amongst themselves. So, um, so that's what we're going to do for the fall hybrid conference is have this hybrid model. Um, presentations will be on Zoom and recorded for later viewing. So now that is when I come to just giving some um, ideas for professional development. And this is based on like what we did with ITSOL and also what I've seen like at my college. Um, my uh, Salt Lake Community College is really big into uh, faculty development and um, also from what I've seen from other affiliates um, through the community boards. So first of all, virtual conferences, uh, definitely these can be live, they can be pre-recorded, uh, hybrid conferences in person and recorded um, conference sessions. You can do all types of conference sessions um, virtually. Um, you're not limited. Um, if you went to the virtual TESOL, um, uh, this year's TESOL convention, you even were able to see poster sessions, which I thought was so great. Um, so uh, definitely there's no limit to what you can do. It's just a matter of having to figure out how, right, how your audience is gonna be able to see things and um, how they're gonna be able to interact, okay? Um, also definitely online graduate student presentations, teaching demonstrations or ideas for professional development. Um, then 
having your affiliate YouTube channel is a nice thing to have because that way you can put, um, you know, recorded sessions on there for your uh, members and pre-recorded sessions. Online community board is something that's really good to help your members be connected. Um, and you could have somebody like a community board representative from your affiliate uh, posting topics um, so that uh, your members can talk about, you know, how it's relevant to what they do in their work. Um, we use both Google groups and also we use social media. A lot of people like to post on Facebook, our Facebook page. And then an online newsletter is really nice to have um, because it gives your members up-to-date information, um, you know, and you'll, you'll be able to post it on the web page. You, you call, you know, you put a call out to your members to ask them if they're, they want to write something for the newsletter and you can always give them a topic that they could write on or maybe something that they're working on. And also posting it on social media is a good thing. Um, online vendor presentations is also something that vendors are usually really happy to do for um, to, to see if they can find potential customers. And then uh, webinars is something that has become really popular this past year. And if you've been watching the all the affiliate community boards, you've been maybe you have seen that there's been webinars on different, um, teaching tips, you know, how to teach a certain thing or, or maybe some technology tool that's really useful for you. Um, different discussions on different topics, um, workshops, um, career advising, um, affiliate information, um, also more information about TESOL because sometimes affiliates can actually talk to their members about how TESOL has been really beneficial for them. Online learning communities is another way that um, we can reach out to our affiliates um, through discussions about books that are relevant to our area. Um, the um, Utah Board of International Educators right now, they are doing an online learning community where they're talking about books about racism and how to um, fight racism. Um, in your institution. Um, and then also you can have an online community about um, articles that are relevant to um, your members' fields and videos. You could have discussions about different videos that are posted. You know, TED Ed videos are really helpful and resources um, to inform your members about what's out there, right? Because there's a lot of free resources, for example, to teach um, members about uh, how to use um, a, a technology app or how to do um, a certain thing in your classroom. Also, there's online free courses. Um, uh, you know, um, the computer assisted uh, language learning interest section actually has some free one day courses sometimes to teach about some topics such as technology tools. And then TESOL and TESOL affiliates, um, definitely sharing with members about um, things that are coming up, you know, like this event um, is really helpful because a lot of our members just, they just don't, um, you know, either they, they don't get the information somehow or they just miss it. And so if we share it with them and say, hey, this is a really important event, that's really um, helpful for them. Okay, so now I have a question actually for the chat and I'm sure the chat has been very active. Um, and so I just want to put this question out and I just want to ask, what are some positive changes that happened to your affiliates professional development in this past year? So this is your opportunity to go ahead and type something into the chat and then I'm going to go ahead and go into the chat and look at that. Okay, let me see if there's any questions. Um, 
Oh, so Annie Altamirano said that their on annual conference last March was online and attended by people from 19 countries. We didn't use Zoom, we hired our platform and it worked wonderfully. Oh yeah, that's great. That's great that that worked out for you. Yeah, um, we did consider different platforms and yeah, our, um, like I said, our board members were like, oh, I think we can, we can run with this, but yeah, it was, it's really interesting. During the conference, we didn't have anybody to help us and we did have some tech problems, um, but actually things went pretty well, which we're really thankful for. Um, uh, Catherine Miller said, our space rental and catering fees are like 80% of the budget. We charge way less because of this. So we save money, but made less money. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, yes, and, uh, excuse me. Um, yes. Maria, in our in our uh, conference, we had we, we split it into uh, four uh, days from 9 a.m. to uh, three o'clock after lunch, more or less, uh, because people felt that a whole day conference would be too long. Mm. So we split it into four weekends. And um, it was really successful. The platform was, worked very well. And uh, we had, of course, the support of all the board and the area coordinators. That is, in Tissol, Spain, we have representatives in different parts of the country. And so those people also helped monitor the sessions, introduce speakers, check the chats. Uh, so mm, we helped each other, but it really worked very well. We didn't have any technical glitches and uh, it's still open for participants. It will be open for six months and uh, people are still interacting. They set up communities <laughs> and people are still interacting through the platform. And, uh, and of course, uh, all in all, the publishers were fairly happy. But as I said, publishers, at least in our experience here in Spain, they are never happy with anything. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they always complain about something. So <laughs> at this time, they said, oh, yes, it worked very well. It's a bit, it's not the same as face to face. What news? <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, all in all, they were, they were quite happy. And uh, participants were very happy with uh, the platform and uh, I think it, it, it's better to use a platform because we could have done it with Zoom but you cannot, I mean we, we couldn't possibly organize it with Zoom uh, only so I, I, because it would lack the um, networking and I think that the networking with this particular platform worked very well. Uh, thank you and forgive me for taking time from you. Oh, no, no. I think it's really good that you you said what you said, because yes, some of our um, some of our attendees did say it was really hard being on Zoom all day. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I completely understand. I mean, I could tell you that I hosted, I was a Zoom host all day Friday and all day Saturday. And it was really, really hard for me because I had to stay on, right? I had to make sure that I was recording each session. I had to make sure that I was helping with any tech issues. Um, and yeah, it's it's just draining to be online all day, um, you know, on a virtual platform. Um, and, you know, and, and then we're doing it right in our work. We're, we're having to be virtual online a lot of times for meetings or teaching, right? And so it's, it's really draining. Yeah. So yeah, some of our members did say that. They said, yeah, it was so hard to be on, you know, for so many hours. And yeah, and we, we had like the same hours as our in-person. So I do think that your idea of having it less hours and then spread out more is definitely a good idea because yeah, it was, yeah. Even for the TESOL conference, I, I, I thought, oh my gosh, this is like really, just in-person is really draining, right? The, for the TESOL convention. And so the in-person, I was just like thinking, it was really good that things, a lot of things were recorded so that I could go back um, and not have to stay on all day. So yeah. yeah. Um, 
Okay. And then, um, yeah, and as far as the publishers, I could say our publishers were not very happy, <laughs> um, you know, and I think what it was, was that um, they were like really great. I mean, when, when I saw what they were doing, I thought it was really great, but, but they were complaining and saying, oh, we didn't get too many participants coming to our room. And, um, you know, we just didn't feel like our information got, um, you know, told to everybody there and, so, but it's the same thing with in-person, you know, publishers are the, they say the same things. We, we didn't get that many participants coming to see us, you know, in person and yeah, why didn't you send them all to us, you know, so yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, read here that Margie Wald said, um, our overall attendance was higher as the conference registration was very low. Um, yeah, that's, that, I think that's a really good thing because I, I find for our, you know, not all of our teachers, not all of our members um, are supported by their educational institution to cover registration. So we have quite a few members who have to pay out of pocket and, um, you know, and for our regular in-person registration, it could be pretty expensive for some of our members. So yeah, I totally understand that. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, Lynn says, I heard y'all to use YouTube Premiere. Um, yes, I heard, I, I've heard that some affiliates use YouTube Premiere also to do their, um, to use as their platform. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh, Annie, again, you said that you didn't change your usual fee, just membership so people could attend and become members for the whole year. Um, yeah, um, we actually had a discussion among our board members um, because at first we were just going to lower our registration fee just slightly um, because, um, you know, we do, you know, we do use that money to like pay for, um, for example, the keynote speakers. Um, but because like for the keynote speakers, we didn't have to pay for travel for them or hotel like we usually do. Um, and food, um, that definitely saved us money. Um, and then also food takes a big chunk of our budget. So we, we had a discussion as a board and, and um, one of the board members said, we can really lower our costs. We ended up, our, our usual cost for the um, in-person conference, two-day conference, we charge um, for regular members, these are not students, graduate students, graduate students get a discount. Um, we charge $120. And, um, and then uh, we lowered the price, I think we end up lowering the price to um, like $25 for both days. Um, and that was mostly because we wanted to cover the cost of membership. And then we wanted to make sure that we cover the cost of the zoom licenses. Um, and then um, also um, we covered, we ended up, we were able to also cover the cost of the keynote speakers. Um, so, so yeah, so that was, that was what our, our costs were. Um, and we, we, we were just like, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Our conference um, was not as tended as well as past in-person conferences. Usually for our in-person conferences, we're always like 150 um, participants and over our um, virtual, our first virtual vol conference, we had a hundred um, participants, a hundred attendees. Um, and I just think um, it was probably because a, a lot of our educators um, were having to deal with a lot of other stuff and they just, they just couldn't come. Um, I know like two of my faculty, they were dealing with just pandemic stuff and it was just really tough for them to be a part of that. So um, let's see, okay. Just looking through the chat. Um, yes, I see that um, TESOL France, you use a platform. Yes, and then um, Georgia TESOL um, use WOVA with Zoom too. And yeah, I, we actually did look at Georgia TESOL. We looked at what you guys 
were doing with your conference um, <laughs> because uh, we were just looking at everybody, what they were doing, and we saw what people were planning and stuff. And yeah, we were just like, oh, look, this group is doing this and this group is doing this. And so we were just trying to see what you know, what is working for people and what's not working for people? How are people planning and how are people organizing this? Um, yeah, and then let's see what else. Okay, Chadia says for the hybrid, you have in person and recorded. Have you considered the hybrid synchronous for the um, keynotes and featured speakers for virtual attendees? Yes, so that's what we're we're thinking to do is we're thinking to make, actually we're thinking to make everything synchronous. Um, so uh, for hybrid, so um, we're hoping that we can just record um, while the person is speaking. Of course, for our keynote speakers, well, for all of our speakers, we definitely have to have permission for them that we can do that. Um, but if it's called a hybrid conference, I think that they kind of recognize that they're going to be recorded, uh, but we do, we will have to um, get their permission beforehand. Um, and yeah, so we're thinking to, to do it synchronously. Um, and like I said, I've attended a, a conference pre-pandemic where it was hybrid and all of the sessions were synchronous. And um, yeah, and so I was able to, I, I attended um, remotely, um, so I was able to see um, the presentations remotely and they were live, so. Um, okay, and then I'm just looking to see if there's any other, I'll be interested. Okay, so Mary Patton says, I'd be interested to see how you plan to record the in-person presentations. Mm -hmm. This is one major hiccup to a hybrid that worries me, having the technology and people available to record those live in-person sessions. Yeah, we've reached out to our, um, our first vice president who's in charge of um, the fall conference and who's also a faculty, well, she's, no, she's a, um, department chair at Snow College. So um, she said that they do have um, their IT department that can support them. Um, uh, I know at my college, at my community college, we actually had um, uh, video cameras installed in our in-person classrooms. So we would be able to just film, you know, a presentation. Um, so yeah, so, but that is definitely a detail that um, our board needs to make sure that that is set up because yeah, because I think that if we just use somebody's laptop, it's not going to be as great as having, <laughs> right, a real video camera there filming it. So yes, so good point, Mary Patton. <laughs> um, let's see, so Margie Wald says, we need to re-envision the expo hall, the online booth is not that useful. Yes, I agree. Um, and then I'm just gonna see if there's any other questions. Oh, and Margie Wall says um, that they have increased attendance and also increased membership. That's great. Yeah, we had been hoping for that um, at our fall conference, but like I said, I think a lot of people were just dealing with um, their own personal pandemic issues, and you know, so many of our um, so many of our intensive English programs were suffering because of the lack of international students. Um, a lot of, I guess, a lot of programs uh, in not only Utah but Wyoming and Idaho had to reduce their um, their instructors um, because of what was going on with the reduction in international students coming. Um, we were able to have more membership interaction this year. We've been trying to revamp our interest sections for a while, and this gives us a great opportunity to connect and get members within our IS. Yes, I agree. Um, okay.
Okay, so um, Lynn says, I'm wondering if the pre-recorded sessions are less well attended since we want to go back, but do people actually go back and watch the pre-recorded ones? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. For our free professional development that we offered in June, um, yeah, I would say that probably that those pre-recorded sessions that didn't have, right, they didn't have Q&A, right, they were just just pre-recorded sessions that we put on your, our YouTube channel. If you see the number of views, it's not that high for um, some of the presentations. Um, but we, we thought, let's try it out. And we thought, you know, let's see if this is something that our members would be interested in. Um, and then as far as uh, for like our fall conference, I, I haven't gotten to see the, the number of views for the sessions after the conference, um, right after the conference, but um, I did get, we did get feedback from the members who said that they were happy that um, they were able to go back and, and view um, sessions that they had missed or, uh, or maybe that they just wanted to go back and look at again, so. Um, Okay, so um, somebody said, can teachers out of your members have access to your um, annual conference? I mean to participate during this time only. So I'm guessing um, this person is asking, can, can people be a, a member or can people come to your annual conference? Yeah, if you're not a member, you can definitely go to the annual conference. We've had, um, for example, at our last conference, we had um, individuals who were working in Japan and also in Sweden and in other states in the United States who came um, not only to present, but also to attend. So it definitely um, our annual conference, I would say our annual conference and even our our fall annual conference and our spring annual conference is definitely open to any um, any individual who would like to attend. And, and we post information about our conferences on, um, on the, the affiliate network um, community board. And also um, I try to post, post it on the affiliate leaders board too. So yeah, it's open to, to anybody who would like to come. Okay, and then um, somebody said, do you have a plan for how to record the live in-person sessions to post later? I always feel like this takes so much planning to do as people and computers. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's possible, you know, like, um, you know, like what I found is we, Zoom is so great. So you can, you know, it, we're gonna have, probably we'll be using Zoom again and, and we'll be, um, uh, showing the live sessions on Zoom for our members who are watching from home, and then um, we're gonna we're going to record them at the same time. And then you know the nice thing with Zoom is is that they'll they'll give you the recording whether on your computer or on your or in a cloud. And then later on you can go ahead and um, you know you can if you want to you can edit those <laughs> those recordings um, and then put them. Like, like we did on the on our YouTube channel. So that's that's I think that's probably going to be our plan for this hybrid conference that we're gonna do in October. Oh, um, Stephanie Stauffer said Penn TESOL East also had fewer attendees at the online fall offer than usual, but we were glad we could serve those who attended and we got attendees from overseas who otherwise would have not been there. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, anybody who was able to come, I'm sure that they they were able to get something out of out of the conference. Um, okay. Margie says, I think that online is so important for targeted events. Members who would not normally travel to an event will join small online events and with very practical foci. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, the thing is, it's like, 
for us, um, we had we had anticipated for our fall conference last year that we would have more than our usual 150 plus members attending um, because many of our members are really spread out. Um, you know, um, and it's really kind of difficult for some people to travel, uh, especially in March. Um, I mean, especially in October uh, for the fall, um, whether it's because of work, you know, they're busy with work or um, just the, the drive is really long for them or they're, they're not supported by their institution, um, you know, to, to cover travel costs or hotel costs. Uh, definitely that's something that that has been, uh, you know, that our members have told us about. So for some of our members, I'm sure that they re really appreciate to, to have that online, that online option. And I think in the future, we're thinking that we're going to probably stay online, um, maybe stay in a hybrid model, because we're, we're really feeling that this is probably going to help many of our members, um, you know, and, and offer to, to many new members. Um, okay. Okay, let's see. Oh, so Georgios is asking, how did the don donations work at the conference, Maria? Did people donate? Good question. Yeah, I, I will have to ask our um, treasurer um, on a report for that. Um, we decided to do that, uh, ask for donations, just because we, um, you know, we thought, well, if 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 anyone wants to do that, um, then it would help out. Like you know, like I said, with um, our membership, um, you know, because we we do make sure we pay for like our website ourselves. We are we are not we're we're in the process of applying to be um, what do you call that? Uh, uh, an institution, an organization that doesn't have to pay taxes, <laughs> but um, right now we're we are still having to pay taxes. So we also have that, and then we pay our treasurer because she's um, like a, an employee of our organization. Um, so we do have costs that we have to cover, and so um, so we we did ask for that. Um, we decided to to make it free because we just thought you know. Our biggest cost for our spring conference always is, is just the, the food. Um, as far as the, key, the the guest speakers, we also do ask our guest speakers if they would like to, um, instead of being paid to be a guest speaker, if they would like to just um, uh, forego that uh, payment and then it, it helps support us as an organization. And sometimes some of our guest speakers will do that um, because they are also active members, so they, they want to, to help out. Yes, and James said the pay what you can model. Yes, that's right. Um, okay. I think I've gotten down to the end. If there's any other questions, I guess if anything, anybody wants to ask out loud or. Well, thank you, Maria. That was really wonderful. If there are any questions, uh, of course we can we can continue um, and, and we can continue perhaps uh, on our uh, event page. Um, yeah, and your contact information is there too. Yeah, just in case, if anybody wants to follow up with me, or if anybody, um, you know, wants to ask questions um, about anything from this presentation, yeah, they can definitely email me. Um, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, uh, Maria. 